Good, mor good morning, everybody. Welcome. Today we take up the last of the ten lies, um, and maybe one of the lies that we hear the most these days, namely, God doesn't judge anyone, so neither should you. Um, the greatest sin in our um, culture today is the sin of intolerance, right? You better tolerate everything or you are judging. And, and hear people say, don't judge. So, on the number one, on the basis of human reason or personal experience, what makes the statement, God doesn't judge anyone, neither should you, so appealing? Why would someone say this? Give me one, Brenda. Um, could be, um, Say that again. So I wonder, like, it could be like misunderstanding, like the notion that like God is forgiving, but also He doesn't judge you. Okay. Well, God forgives. That means He doesn't judge, right? Maybe that, and and so maybe there is a, you know, on the basis of reason, even Scripture. Well, God is forgiving, therefore He doesn't judge. Neither should you. Give me another one. Jeanette, did you have your hand up? Right? Anything goes. Right? This, this is why people say, oh, this is great. I can do what I want. Don't judge me. You're, you're, that's your decision, your truth, my truth are two different things. Give me another one. Mark. Well, Scripture says judge not, lest ye be judged. So they kind of extrapolate that a bit too far Right? God, the Bible says. I mean, here's what I've, I've got evidence. It says right here, do not judge. And uh, I mean, this is like, people may know no other Bible passages, but they, they know that one. <laughs> Give me another one, Eric. God is love. God is love. He's not judgmental, right? He, he, it, there's another good Bible passage. God is love. Give me another one, Luke. This is a, say that last part again. Discipline is a form of love. It's just difficult for us to see. Discipline is a form of love, right? Sometimes we think, well, God be loved, let, let's, you know, God, God forgives you. God is gracious. You know, he doesn't hold you account. Not, not true. Go ahead, Randy. We can't judge because what is the standard? Right? What, what's the standard? Um, we we to to judge means there is an absolute truth, right? If 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 everything's relative, if this you know if that car is pretty to you, you're judging me because I think it's ugly. Well, you can't do that. It's it's all in your opinion anyway, right? I can't judge you if your opinion is different than my opinion. I can't judge you for for rooting for the. Detroit Lions that the Packers are becoming. <laughs> Give me another one. It's kind of a little bit sideways. If there is no judgment from God or anybody else, there's really no need for forgiveness. If there's no judgment, there is no need for forgiveness. Right? Good point. Anybody else? One more. Chairman Brian. This way, I don't have You're, you're making me feel bad. The ultimate sin is to make me feel bad. That is hate language, right? You are hating on me because you are looking at my behavior, comparing it to a standard that it doesn't meet, and therefore you're being mean, right? That, that, that's a huge one. You've hurt my feelings, right? Because you pointed out something about me that now I'm uncomfortable ab about because you, you pointed this out, right? It, it's kind of ironic. Um, I think this statement judges people for judging, right? They, 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 they turn the, the tables on us. Now they're judging us for judging, right? They're intolerant of intolerance. So it, it's kind of all the same thing. Um, I think the also other thing I'd say is 
God doesn't judge anyone, so neither should you. It's a little bit of, you are a hypocrite. You follow that God, and you aren't doing what he's, he does, so you are fake, right? You, you're not walking the walk. Uh, if God says, do not judge, and he doesn't, you know, he's forgiving, uh, he's accepting, he's non-judgmental. Um, why, why aren't you? You, you, are, you say you're one of his followers. Why don't you do the same thing, you hypocrite, right? That's part of it. Luke, you got one more? Great point, right? D- judgment often has this negative term. You're, 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 you're condemning me. A- an A grade is a judgment, right? To, to say, well done, good and faithful servant, is a judgment. To, to say God doesn't judge, well, that's simply not accurate. Okay, so let's start, break this into two pieces. First of all, I mean, the premise that God says do not judge is that, is that, or that, that God doesn't judge. Is, is that true? Let's take a look at a couple ones. Um, does, um, how do the following passages help you address the statement, Jesus or God doesn't judge anyone? John 12, Jesus says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Well, there you have it. God doesn't judge. Jesus says, it goes on, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day. What light does that passage shed on the the statement, God doesn't judge? Does that does that support it? Cheryl. Well, God doesn't judge for those who have faith in him, but if you don't have faith in him, then you're going to be judged. Like every Bible passage, we need to take it in context, right? You need to read the whole thing. Yes, Jesus says, I did not come to judge. No, he at his first coming, he, he came to save. Right? That's his, that's his point here. He didn't come to judge. He came to save. But as he goes on to say, but that doesn't mean somebody's not going to judge. There is going to be a judgment. In fact, his very words will judge us. So when people say, no, Jesus didn't judge. Yes, he did. His, his words will still judge us. That's still the yardstick that, that we will use to judge. So don't say Jesus didn't judge. A couple other passages, Psalm 9, verse 8. God rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. Obviously, God judges. I hate all who do wrong, uh, Scripture says, right? But he judges fairly, equitably, right? He judges justly. Uh, He is not a... uh, a uh, Im- improper judge. He's not on the take, right? He, he, he judges justly now and in the future, which he refers to, Acts 17. For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So God obviously will judge. He will judge through Jesus but he will definitely judge. So, agree or disagree? Because God judges people, so should Christians. Gary. We can't judge perfectly. God can. Therefore, we shouldn't judge. Is that what you're saying? We can't judge perfectly. Julia.
tell them this is what we're bringing to a judgment. But we, I don't, I agree. I don't agree. <coughs> maybe, and I think this is maybe Gary's point. When we talk about judging, what can we judge and what can we not judge? When I say God judges people, therefore, so should we. Maybe you're judging the behavior, but not the punishment behavior. Okay. Maybe I'm not judging the punishment. What, when we say we shouldn't judge people, what can't we judge? Faith. There's an important distinction. You hear that? We, we cannot judge their motives. I cannot read hearts. I don't know why you did that. You know, and we're tempted to do that, right? I know why you did that because, no, I, I, I cannot read that heart. Only God can. However, I can and I must judge. And by judge, we don't necessarily mean damn or condemn, right? As you, that was the second point here. Only God condemns. God decides that person is going to hell. I cannot say that. But I can, as, as was nicely said, I can compare their words and actions with what God's will in his word is. Right? That's a judgment call. I can compare. Does this match this? Right? Um, that, that, that. That's a judgment. When sitting in the back seat or back row of my, with my grandson, right? Is this, is this an elephant in the Noah's Ark? Yes, it is. He made a judgment call there. Yeah, elephant. Okay, well, he judged. It's okay, he, he didn't sin. It's okay. Brenda. Great, great point, right? Our judgment is different in that sense that I'm not perfect, right? I am a, uh, a kettle calling the pot black, but it's still black, <laughs> e even though I, I, I'm a sinner too. That doesn't mean I don't have a right to notice that that pot is black, right? Um, God is, is not. God is, God is holy. Okay, add to that. Barney. I think what he's focusing on in, in John 10, the question was, is there a contradiction? I mean, Jesus said he doesn't judge later, he is going to judge. Uh, the, in, 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 Act, or in John 10, he's really focusing on why I came. I didn't come to be the policeman, right, to, to hammer people with the law. I came to rescue people. Now, in the end, if they say, forget it, there will be consequences there will be a, a, an ultimate judgment to that. Bruce. <clears throat> Great point. I, I hope that came out. That this is an agree, yes, right. That G, God says you you owe it to your fellow men. You owe it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Speak the truth in love, right? Do not ignore it. 
If somebody's got cancer, don't say, well, I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings. Listen, I, I, I need to tell you that this is a healthy lung and this is what your lung looks like. That this is a problem, right? A absolutely. That, not in a condescending way, uh, not in a, I'm a better than thou, it's simply acknowledging here's the standard and here's where, where you fit and I'm, I'm somewhere on that scale as well. Let's, let's talk about that very thing. Next page. The, the Bible says two things, right? The Bible says, do not judge, which is what everybody, the passage everybody knows. The Bible also says, judge correctly. So it sounds like a contradiction. Uh, do, are we supposed to judge or aren't we? He says, no. He says, yes. Context matters. Let's take a look. John 7 24. Stop judging. Now she's, again, if you ended there, well, there you have it. Don't judge. No. Read it in context. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So there, God's statements, do not judge, come with these qualifications. How, what's the right and wrong way to judge? What do you learn from this one? about the, the wrong way to judge. Back there, Luke. It's easy to make judgments based on what we think someone's others are. We cannot make those judgments because we do not know the heart, so we must judge solely by the actions of the people. Don't do it by mere appearances. This is what I think, right? This is what, you know, um, it, it appears. You think about just a couple Bible passages, uh, stories like that, right? Where, where Hannah is praying, you know, without moving her lips, not saying anything, and Eli judges her by assuming what? She's drunk, right? She's been drinking again. That's a judgment. That's, a, that's by mere appearances. That's wrong. When, when uh, the, 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 the woman of uh, 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 adulterous woman comes into Simon Peter's, or Simon the leper's house, I should say, and, and they're all saying, a sinner, a sinner. They're judging her, whereas God, Jesus, had forgiven her, right? They're, they're, they're judging her by her appearance or by her reputation. And, um, uh, same thing, don't, don't judge by uh, appearance. Well, let's tackle the one that everybody jumps to. Do not judge, but notice it doesn't end there. Context matters. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Again, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they must may trample they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So in context, the, Jesus is not somebody, never judge. What, what is he saying? What's his real point? Here, Jeanette. Judge wisely. Judge wisely. You want to add, add to that? Brenda. The, the point, don't be a hypocrite. Don't, don't apply to somebody else a standard that you have not applied yourself first. That's his point. 
Don't judge others without looking in the mirror first. He's not saying don't do it. In fact, he says do it. After you look at yourself, he then says, yes, then go take the speck out of that guy's eye. He's not saying to ignore the speck in the other guy's eye. He's still saying there's a judgment that needs to be made, but you better know where you're coming from first. Or, or all the judging in the world, even if you're trying to help that person, is not going to help them because you are being um, a hypocrite about it. Don't it. So in verse 2 there, it seems that we're being indirectly told to use Great point, right? This is how we do it. He's not, de- he is not uh, saying we can't do it, but with what attitude? Are, are we pompous? Are we better than thou? Show mercy, right? And, and we're going we're gonna to get to that, that the whole point of judging is to lead them to repentance so that you can offer them God's forgiveness. You're not to walk away there. I, I, I put him in his place, did my job. That is not your job. I mean, that, that is the first step, maybe, but not with that attitude, right? Point, point out there's a problem so God can offer a solution. Don't be stuck in your sin. I love you too much to allow you to be stuck in your sin. I therefore point that out. I saw another hand. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, back there. Mary. Great point, right? I, I cannot judge simply by my feelings, my opinion, right? It, I, I need to go to an objective standard, right? And now I'm just a voice for God instead of just me thinking that's wrong. We, we're real, we have to be real careful. Well, I think that, no, this is what God says, right? This is objective, not subjective. Let's look at a couple others. Um, Romans 2, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment, you who pass judgment do the same things, right? This is kind of the restatement of the last one. It's don't be a hypocrite. Look at yourself first. You're, 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 you're judging, even if what you're saying is wrong, even if what you're saying is right, if it's coming from a bad place, you are wrong. Another one. People say, yeah, but the Bible doesn't want you to judge. How about this one? But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy an idolater or slanderer, a drunker or swindler, do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Of course, the, the applied answer is yes, you are. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. How do I not, um, ju- how do I carry out that command without making a judgment call about sin? It's impossible. It requires it, right? I, how do I expel the wicked person if I don't say that what you did was, was sin? Mary, I mean, uh, Kate. Is this um, talking about inside the church? Yeah. Yes, you would, you, would, you would handle sin outside of the faith different from, from inside. I have a responsibility to point out sin inside of somebody who says I'm a fellow Christian and I'm living in sin. I, I, I owe it to them. I, I do not necessarily need to walk around pointing out sin to, to unbelievers and saying what, what you're doing is wrong. I mean, it, it might give me a... a, a an opportunity to share the gospel, but that's not my 
responsibility. You want to add to that, Kathy? Oh, well, so I was looking at it. It's Bellwood Hicks versus Monroe. That says to me that we're looking at inside sit-inside versus inside church. Well, No, great point, right? Let your light shine that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I, I, it, it's a little different audience, you know. Um, if the unbeliever goes, let him go. But I, I have that responsibility. So, yeah, what is it? This is excommunication. This is how Scripture would describe excommunication. You're telling a brother that he's not a brother because he is clinging to sin instead of clinging to the Savior is what this is talking about. Mark. In the gym. I think we should recognize that we can be paralyzed into saying nothing because we can't say it perfectly. <clears throat> you know, we can't do it correctly. And, you know, I remember working in the paper mill and this guy wasn't doing his job. And I said, You didn't do what you're supposed to do, and I have to do it. He says, Well, aren't you a Christian? You're going to be a pastor. You can't talk to me like that. So, you know, he was very adept at, uh, you know, throwing it back at me. I said, Don't give me that <laughs> job. <laughs> Right? Just because we aren't imp- we, we, it's because we're imperfect doesn't mean we can't point out that. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the nurse that told me I have high cholesterol, maybe her cholesterol ain't so good either. I don't know. <laughs> Jim. Uh, what we said before, it seems to contradict this, is that we can't judge because we have no standards. But there are standards, you know, as far as sin is concerned, whether, you know, they're drunk in this or moral, so we do have some standards where we can judge somebody based on sin. Great point. Because there are standards, we can judge. I mean, that's what we're doing. Where there's no standards, I mean, God doesn't say it's a sin to be a Lions fan, so I can't condemn anybody for that, right? There are other things he does say. (laughs) That's good. One more. Jeanette. Okay, well, if a believer is sinning and and Great segue. We will get to that passage. Thank you. Let me wrap up here. Galatians 6 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. What what guideline is that? How do I can how do I I judge properly? What 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 addition does this bring, Brenda? Right? Make sure you are not on your high horse uh, as you're doing this. You, your, your, your purpose is not to feel better about yourself because you are humiliating this person or running them down. The whole purpose is to restore that person, not to drag them down, but to lift them up, right? That's the, the purpose of, of judging. Ephesians, I touched on this. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Man, what a what a what a mouthful, right? Speak the truth, but do it in 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 love. And and sometimes the truth hurts, but uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Speak the truth in love. We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Right? It, it's okay to tell right from wrong. That's speaking the truth. That's judging. 2 Timothy, all scriptures God breathe and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. How do you do that without judging, without pointing out sin? That's the whole point. Um, it's not all, that's not the only message of scripture, but that's one of them. The law is a mirror in which it allows me to see things about myself and others that are ugly. One more in that line. James 5, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring back that person, 
Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Right? What's at stake? People's eternal lives. This is why we speak about these things. It's not, well, I wouldn't want to hurt them. I wouldn't want them to get angry. Right? I wouldn't want to hate on them. No, the whole point is if somebody's life is on the line, I need to bring that out. Let's go, let's go Larry, please. <clears throat> uh, just kind of, uh, I think kind of this. Yesterday I was doing a memorial service. A young man who was a relative, kind of a relative to my wife. And uh, we were at a Catholic church. And some of the things were kind of busy about what the priest was saying. But when he stated, tell me if I'm wrong, he said, that God knows everything. Therefore, he knew A.D. was going to commit suicide, so it was his will. I'm going to put up here. <laughs> Six. <laughs> Yikes. God does not, does, does not sin. He does not participate in sin. God does not will that. Can God use even sin for a good purpose? Does God know the future? Absolutely. Does he will it, everything that happens? Absolutely not. And I know that's rationally hard for us to comprehend. Well, how could God know it and not want it? God, God knows it, but he allows us to use our free will. It's, if, if it's truly free will, he gives us the freedom to sin against his will. Bob. Speaking the truth in love is, is critical. Big point. Bruce. Uh, to that point, um, the law teaches us a, a, a need for a savior that the gospel uh, helps us understand that, that true thing. And so, uh, you know, it takes me back to that uh, a couple sections back where it where points about three and then out three. And it reminds me of Paul's letters his churches and said call out all these sinful things that they were involved in and then he said but that is who you were right the gospel that can be applied to the repentant sinner right that's, that's what you're trying to get to somebody say I was wrong and you are forgiven. It was paid. You will not die, right? That's what you're getting to. When the person says, I don't have a problem, then your solution means nothing to them. I don't have a problem, you know? If, uh, if, uh, if I say I'm a world-class heart surgeon and I'm performing free heart surgery for anybody who wants it, you, none of you are going, yeah, open up my chest, please. Unless yesterday your cardiologist said, if you don't get open heart surgery, you're going to die. Free one, I'll take it. <laughs> Same thing. First law, then gospel. Let's talk about that. How do we do that? How do we do that in love? Jeanette referred to it. Um, Matthew 18. If your brother or sister sins, brother or sister sins, right? Not physical, spiritual, fellow Christian, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Whatever you, 
when you tell somebody that their sins are not forgiven because they are still unrepentant, that is binding in heaven. In fact, this is a weird Greek phrase that literally will have been a future passive. It will have been, because God has already decided, you're just announcing it. When somebody's unrepentant, God has made that call already, and you're just announcing it. And it, on the other thing is true as well. If this person repents, you can forgive them because it will have been forgiven already. God already has made that decision. You are simply announcing it. Again, I truly, I tell you that if one, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. You know, the whole concept of, of church discipline is, is part of that. God is a part of this, right? As we are making these decisions, this person is outside of the church. God stands behind that. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Notice the emphasis is not, well, how many times should I judge him? (laughs) No, it's how many times should I forgive him? That's the goal, right? That's what we're trying to get to, is to lead that person to a place where we can offer that forgiveness, which is the first question there. Number five, how does this portion of scripture demonstrate that God's delight is not catching people in their sins, but rather forgiving them. Back there, Tom. Now you can start with 77 times. I think that's another word for unlimited. So the stress is on forgiveness. And you also have to the first paragraph that's kind of the approach to it. It's kind of a very subtle approach. It's one-on-one, and it considers a number church. It shows a point to reconciliation and forgiveness. Right? This is the goal. How, what steps can we take to get to this goal? The goal is forgiveness, right? And if you, if, you, if you confront them with a whole church and now they're all defensive, you might not get to that. You're much better to get to forgiveness by one-on-one. Just, this is between you and me. I'm not telling anybody else, but I know that this is where your, your situation, this is the, the evidence that I have. I'm calling you to repentance so I can assure you that Jesus has paid for that. And if you aren't willing to hear that, now I'll bring one or two more. I'm trying to protect your reputation, but I'm really trying to get to, you are forgiven. You are forgiven, right? That's that's his point. And and everything that comes with that, restoration, peace, you know, unity with a body of believers again. These are all the goals that start with, and you are right with God again. That's, That's our goal. That's what God is not here to shame people, but to bring them to forgiveness. Jesus tells us to warn someone of their sin in progressive steps. Why? If if Jesus expects that the admonishment of the entire church might have the greatest impact, why not just start with that? Man, why waste your time with all these little visits? Just pull out the big gun, man. Luke. Great point, right? That our, our goal is to, yeah, to bring them love. How do we best express that in, in a way that's going to have a positive impact on them? Good point. Somebody else, Jeremiah. Do you feel like all throughout the Bible, God was very intent on having more than one witness? If you jump from one-on-one to the whole church involvement, there could be misunderstandings or even from the whole judgment. So to do it this way sets up a Great, great point, right? You notice what, I mean, this is the eighth commandment. God wants to protect people's reputation. I mean, I, I don't want to flaunt that the guy's a sinner. If I can get him to for, be forgiven, then nobody needs to know all that stuff, right? That, that's my goal is not all this. If I get to all this, it's, it's simply because I've, I've 
uh, exhausted all my avenues, and this person's going to go to hell, and I, I'm, I'm pulling out all the stops. But if I can get it before that, I certainly will, so that nobody needs to know this other than, there, here's another, as we all are, sinners who are, I have found, found the bread. Here, Brenda. Well, and also by skipping all those steps, too, um, like if that's your first one that you go to, then that's how you can even talk to that person individually. So I don't think that's like gossip. If you just, it's like, I don't know, like if I'm like caught in a sin, and then the next thing I know, it's like nobody talks to me about it. Great point, right? That, that what that really would be gossip, right? And that can only happen, and it's got to be true, but it can only happen after I have spoken to this person about it to protect their, their reputation. Eighth commandment, Robin. It's a little louder. Great, right? <laughs> this, this is frontline ministry, right? That every one of you has the keys to the kingdom. This is not just the pastor. You know, that's the board of elders does that. No, this is you as a Christian. You have the keys. And God says, you have this responsibility to a brother. If your brother sins against you, go tell the pastor. No, it does not say that. <laughs> Go just between the two of you. This is love. I, I love you too much to have you caught in this disease. That that's that's love. And if it never gets to the pastor, fantastic, right? I I was wrong. You know, I was didn't know what I was thinking. You are forgiven, right? How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? So that's the end result, right? If, if they do not repent, treat them as a pagan and tax collector. In other words, toilet paper their house, <laughs> call them their stupid. What, what does that mean? And how does that shape how you treat someone who has not repented of a sin? What, what's the, what does that mean? <laughs> treat them as a pagan and tax collector. That just means you don't associate with it means you don't associate with them. Maybe. Right. You certainly pray for them. Mandy. Right? They, they, they have entered the mission field. <laughs> right? They have now become prospects. They are not brothers and sisters anymore. You're not going to say, I'm one with you in your sin, but I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to reach out to you. You're welcome to come and worship with us. How else are you going to hear law and gospel these days? And so even when somebody is excommunicated, there is always the, you are, you are welcome. No, you, you are not welcome at the Lord's table because I would be harming you if you came to the Lord's table and you were unrepentant, but you are welcome and I, I, will, I will still love you um, I, I will not assure you that you are forgiven, but I will, I mean, yeah, that you, I will, I will, I will love you. Mary. I was telling my team at work, the power of the follow-up, you know, and that, so someone might not be ready to hear what you have to say to them at first, right? But if you shut them out, they will never know what they love. And also, so that consistent, I think, Great, great point, right? Still love them. I mean, sometimes a parent will come to me and say, oh, my, my daughter is dating an unbeliever or married an unbeliever, and oh, I'm so upset, so disappointed, you know. 
what am I supposed to do? Love them. <laughs> Keep building a relationship. I mean, don't condone sin, but love them. Show them that God is a gracious God and that you are appreciative for God's grace to you, a sinner too. Let them see Jesus in you. Absolutely. Luke, please. Showing that love properly also allows outside perspectives to see the love of Christ through your actions. Right. Some people, I mean, all they think is the church is condemning, the church is full of hate. To, to say, no, I, I, I still love you. I love you enough to point out this is, this is where you are walking away from God's path. So let's take a couple uh, uh, real-life uh, reactions. How would you respond to the following statements? <laughs> My church attendance is between me and God. This is sometimes preceded by the statement, I ain't signing that blinkity-blank <laughs> friendship register. This is between me and God. In other words, don't judge me. What do you say? Are we judging people? Tom. This is more about love and care for the ones you love. It's a body of Christ. And it is about judgment. That's what the member of the nation does. <laughs> Reaching out to those to see how can we get you engaged in your word? How can I help you? If you have called me to be your shepherd, I have a responsibility to make sure my sheep are fed. And, and here's one of the pieces of evidence that I use that people are hearing the word that they are feeding their faith. That they are not despising the word, which would be breaking the third commandment. And so, yes, if it, it if appears that you are despising the word because you have not been in church for two years, and I point that out to you, it's because I love you. I, you know, if, um, and, and when somebody tells me, as they some recently did, you have no idea where I am in my spiritual life. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> right? You, you can't judge me. You don't know what I'm doing, what I'm doing in my life. Yeah, you are a member of Mount Olive. <laughs> I'm your shepherd. That's an issue, right? You haven't been in church for three years. Don't tell me it's wrong for me to point that out to you. This is what love does, right? Haven't you ever heard, love your neighbor as yourself? Don't judge me. You're supposed to love people. You're, you're not showing love when you're judging me. Go, Brenda. Um, I mean, I would also want my neighbor to call me out on my nonsense if I'm thinking that's harmful to myself or others. I'm still wanting to like, have that Great point. Do you, do you realize that, well, some of you have been at Mount Olive a long time, but many of you have joined in the last, since I've been here, which is becoming a longer time. <laughs> um, when you went through basic training, I took you through a document that talked about a covenant that, that you are making with Mount Olive with the members of Mount Olive, with our church. And in that covenant, you, you made this promise. <laughs> Trusting God to help me, grateful for the grace he's shown to me, and desiring to honor God with the life he's given me. So it's all gospel motivation. This is not law. This is because I am grateful to God, I commit to doing a number of things, worshiping regularly, praying for the church, supporting the church, uh, not gossiping, da-da-da. The last two, I commit myself to allowing others to offer brotherly admonition 
according to Matthew 18, when I am in error. Nobody should be surprised when the board of member ministry knocks on your door and says, we're concerned about where you are in your spiritual life. Why is that? Because you asked us to. You, you wanted that. This is what brothers do. If you don't come to the dinner table for a week on end and I'm your parent, I'm going to say something, right? This is what love does. I, Lord, remember, you know, wh why are you doing this? Because I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't go to the trouble of knocking on your door or giving you a call. I got other things to do. This is what love does. Kind of related. This is my life. I don't poke my nose in your life and judge you. Maybe you should, <laughs> right? If my house is on fire in the middle of the night, please stick your nose in my business. <laughs> Knock, pound on my door. Well, I might wake him up. He might be upset. No, <laughs> my house is on fire. You pound on my door. You're not meddling in my life. You are showing concern for me. Even if I didn't realize this was going on. Really? Yes, tell me. Objectively, tell me. Don't say, well, I just think. No, see that flame? <laughs> that's a problem. That, that's what we're doing. Here's the evidence. You haven't been in church for three years. There's, there's the evidence. Um, now, that may not be the whole picture, but it's a picture that is part of being a, a member of a Mount Olive family. If you are, want to be part of this family, I'm not saying you, you, you need to be a part of Mount Olive to be in heaven, but if you're part of Mount Olive, this is what it looks like. Because God says this is what Christians do. Anybody else? Uh, Scott. It's a good point that you shared about the four member ministry. Um, you know, that you have this group that calls on our members. That are it's also important for all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ that are here today to recognize that a brother and sister that hasn't been in the house of the Lord or hasn't been in, you know, in the Bible study to encourage them as well. That it's not just the board or it's not just the pastor that has to make these calls. But we all need to really be cognizant of all our brothers and sisters and where they are in the relationship with God. Great point. Right? You, you are... You're that much closer to the issue. You know, it's sometimes hard for people to imagine that, you know, the board of members ministry really loves us. Whereas your, your neighbor, somebody that has a relationship with you, your, your brother, your, your wife, your child, that, that relationship is already there. Bruce. Great point, right? The sooner this is evident, that's where we, we categorize straying. You know, I don't, I don't know if they're just flat inactive, but it's something's, something's amiss here, and we, we'll need to explore it. Let's talk. You know, how, what, what's up? You know, oh, I, I've been in the hospital. Wow. Oh, man, no wonder. You know, uh, whatever. I had COVID. Oh, okay. Right? I've just, I, I saw some smoke. Um, let, let's investigate it. Right? In love. It's not, not meddling, but I love you too much to just say, well, I'm sure they'll stray back. <laughs> Sheep don't just stray back. Um, same thing. Who are you to judge two men who love each other? We're all sinners anyway, right? Uh, yes, we are. We are all sinners. But there's a difference between being a sinner and living in it and being unrepentant about it. In fact, right before you made the commitment to make sure that somebody comes and visits you, uh, brotherly admonition, you also committed, you are committed to refusing to live in obvious acts of the sinful nature, right? That's what would lead Paul to say, expel the wicked brother. That, that there's a difference there. Is that expel sinners? No, unrepentant sinners. Sinners are welcome. I mean, place would be empty without sinners. Unrepentant sinner is a different story. A couple quick ones yet. Agree or disagree? Our world would be a much better place if God and humans followed the rule, no judging. <laughs> what if parents never told their children that they were doing wrong? Good, please. Right. 
If we don't judge people on the basis of scripture, how would they know right and wrong? Our world would be chaos. If the policeman said, well, <laughs> sorry, I wouldn't want to judge you, <laughs> right? I, I know you shot the, that guy, but ah, ah, I wouldn't want to say, you know, make you feel bad. We, our, our, our world is built on, and we would be furious if God wasn't ultimately the judge, right? That, that person who has been abused, right? That we say, oh, yeah, I can't, no judgment. No, there is judgment. There is going to be on the last day those who have been oppressed, those who have been abused. Um, there, there will be justice uh, for them in the end. So how do you respond to someone who says, God doesn't judge anyone, neither should you? Here, Brenda. God does judge, and he gives us a standard to use to judge. This is the importance of the word that I know scripture. So it's not just my opinion and my culture, and I think if you don't use the right hymnal, you're going to hell. No, that's, that's cultural. That's not scriptural, right? I, I need to hold on to what God has revealed and recognize the whole purpose is this is a means to an end, right? Right? I am diagnosing a problem so that I can offer you the only real solution. That's the goal. Do not see, this is, my job is to to point out these. No, my job is to present the gospel. And people who know they are sinners have an appreciation for a solution in Jesus. That's proper judging. Next week, we are going to kind of finish out the year with a little different uh, series. Um, uh, a number of years ago, um, maybe, yeah, quite a few years ago, I did, a, did a, a series on Prepared to Answer. Some of you are familiar with that book. Um, it's going to take up some of these same type of things, uh, questions that skeptics raise. For example, next week, we just, we just spent 10 weeks talking about what the Bible says, right? That this is, our, this is what we go to. Well, how about, the, how about the unbeliever says, well, why should I believe the Bible? Oh, why should I believe the Bible? We're going to talk about that. There are people I'll never be able to forgive. What do I say? So if a skeptic says to you, I can't forgive the person, what are you going to say? Religion only puts barriers between people. All the church cares about is money. How do I know I'm a Christian? These are some of the topics we're going to take up through the end of the year. I hope you will join us. Let's close with a prayer. Lord God, thank you for using your powerful tools of law and gospel to uncover our sin and then cover it with your blood. This gives us a message to share with others to have an impact on their lives for time and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Make sure you sign up if you didn't. See you next week.